Good day, everyone. It's your old pal Scooter coming to you live from the Granville Guitars World Headquarters here in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida. Want to welcome you to, uh, let's see, where I'm calling this the Marx Brothers Showman because a bunch of work was done inside this amp over the years, and I'm not sure if it's supposed to be a joke or not. Um, Showman's a fine amp has a lot in common with the twin reverb although it does not have reverb obviously um from the front we see uh, a black face panel as you can see as you would expect um the the cloth is not right it's it's been changed at some point and uh the logo appears to be okay i think um I don't know, that may be a reissue. We're, we're not sure just yet. All of the knobs have been replaced. If you've looked at any of my previous uh, videos, you'll see that the Snowman 8 is missing from all of these knobs. And a 65, which is what this is, would definitely have had Snowman knobs. So we're missing the original knobs. Uh, also, if you look closely at the top of the cabinet, there are some mystery holes where it looks like some kind of a mount or a handle was mounted right there and also right here. Um, you can see I've removed the chassis straps and screws and nuts because I've already had this thing open and I've already discussed it with the owner as to what is going to happen with this amp. A bunch of work's been done to it and uh, this is not going to be necessarily a case of returning something to stock but kind of returning it to maybe sanity. Because <laughs> there's a few things that were done in here that uh, were just purely either lazy or ignorant or I'm not sure what. Some things that weren't done that should have been done and, you know, some of that kind of thing. So um, anyway, we're going to make this old girl fly again. Um, it came in blowing fuses, and I have a feeling I know what was causing all of that. Uh, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna investigate this. If that's something that might interest you, stay tuned, and we're gonna hack away at this girl. Hang on here. Okay, we're gonna start this little horror show on the flip side, um, underneath what's called the doghouse, and the doghouse is where the uh, high-powered electrolytic capacitors live. Now let's have a peek real quick here if this will focus in on this it'd be lovely if it will and it will okay right there you see the D C and B nodes there on the other side of the choke the choke is TR2 we'll be getting to that soon too um, each of those capacitors is 20 microfarad at 525 volts that extra 25 probably isn't necessary, and, and a modern replacement that I use is 22 microfarad at 500 volts, and those are plenty. And you see those dropping resistors across each one. There's a 4700 ohm 1 watt, a 1K 1 watt. Okay, and then on the other side of the standby switch, we have those two big dogs right there. A pair of 70 UF at 35, or I'm sorry, at 350 volts in a totem pole arrangement with 220k dropping resistors in parallel with each thus creating a 700 volt capacitor basically okay now let's move back here to the these these are for the the filtering for the preamp stages okay here's what they did they clearly had a sale on 60 UF at 475 volt caps because that's all they put in here. They used the same cap for all five positions. And let's see if I can turn this around so you can see it. Yeah. 60 UF at 475 volts. Now, you can play around with the totem pole. That's these two here that are arranged end to end. The dropping resistors, the 220Ks are arranged down inside between the here and there. And those are going to get changed too. They didn't change those, and you always should. They also didn't change the old dropping resistors, which are up here, and you always should. Those guys are part of the filter supply, and they see a lot of smacking around. They need uh, they need to be replaced when it's time. Um, 
and it, it baffles me as to why that wasn't done. Now, I, if we're going back to the main totem pole, these two here were originally 70 UF. There is absolutely, positively no reason on earth to go to a lower capacitance in this totem pole. They went to a lower capacitance and a higher voltage, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. You can definitely play around with this. I'm going to replace these with 100 UF at 500 volts, or I'm sorry, 100 UF at 350 volts, which is plenty. Uh, the original caps were 350, and that gives you a 700 volt uh, main power node. But this is not, <laughs> I don't understand why you would go down there unless that's all you had. Okay, so let's say that's all they had. All right, whatever. Then they come down here and they use the same 60s for the preamp filtering. Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you don't want to triple the amount of capacitance on those preamp nodes. Will it make sound? Yeah, it'll make sound. It'll be relatively lousy compared to what it was originally. So that, that's, uh, that's a head scratcher right there. Clearly it's a head scratcher. And, you know, the work was done okay, I suppose. But these caps are so huge that the cap can had to be forced down. And th on this side, the, the, the last node, it's hanging off the board because it's so large. I mean, those had to be stuffed in there. It just kind of, it, it's, it upsets me a little bit because there's, there's always a right way to do things. And this is not it. This is definitely not it. This is a vintage piece here. Okay, so the horror show continues now. We're going to move over here and look to the uh, transformers. Output transformer here looks to be original. I think it's in good shape. Here's the poor, long-suffering little choke in this amp. And I'm going to show you something here. If we zoom in, you can see that the tab had broken off. And instead of spending $30 on a new choke, which is about what a new choke would cost today. I don't know, this, this repair was done uh, uh, apparently years ago. Um, I'm gonna estimate probably at least 20 years ago. They decided to weld that tab back on. Okay, probably not smart because this is an inductor. And if you overheat that thing like you do when you weld something, um, you could cause damage to it. Definitely. But they decided to do, to do that. That's not the worst of it. Here's the worst of it. On the other side, the tab was totally broken off, and they decided to weld it to the chassis of the amplifier. Nice clean welds. I'll give them that. But this is patently insane, folks. Absolutely insane. The, the filter choke is a part of of the filter supply of this amplifier. And as such, it takes a beating. And it's important to how an amp feels. This is nuts. This is absolutely nuts. I cannot believe that I'm looking at this right now. No excuse for that. There are ways to make that work, even broken. But welding is not one of them. Somebody was, I'm sure, a jack of all trades and saw their spot welder in the corner and they hadn't used it in a while and said, well, I'm just going to weld this some bitch right to the chassis. Well, <laughs> remarkably, this choke is measuring. It's, not, it's measuring weird, but I think it actually is working. We're going to replace that choke. I'm going to have to get this off of here. I might have to get out an angle grinder to do it. But that choke needs to go away. It's not reliable anymore. It's not, I, I can't depend on it. I can't send it out of here with that. And the owner fortunately agrees with me. So uh, that little girl, which looks to be original, it's a 65. The uh, power transformer is a 64. And let's see, the output transformer is also a 64. But the amp is March of 65, according to its tube label, which is present. And the code on it is uh, OC which would be uh, March of 65. So, yeah, uh, it's original, and he's going to retain it, you know, for 
future usage or whatever, if he sells it, he can say, hey, here's the original choke for that amp. But we're going to put a brand new choke in it. Um, I actually have a period correct one, uh, which could, you know, which does function and could go into this amp and, you know, make it look original. But um, he's opted for the uh, the modern replacement, and I don't really think I blame him, honestly, because, you know, that's an area in the circuit where that gets hammered, and you don't really want to take too many chances on it. While we're over here, here's another look at the filter supply. There are those two uh, bridging resistors. They're not bridging resistors, I'm sorry. Ah, dropping resistors. Right down there. Whoops. Anybody want to send me a new tripod? <laughs> there we go. All right, we have a 4700 ohm here, and we have a 1000 ohm here. And uh, you can see these caps really aren't leaky. They're Spragues. In their day, these were good ones. Uh, but they're not the right values, and they're old. So we're going to replace them with modern equivalents. Um, F and T's, that's what I use. So that, that's going to end up much, much better. Um, but those resistors, those bridging resi or dropping resistors, rather, I keep saying bridging. Those are not bridges. Those are droppers. Um, those need to be replaced. Um, they're carbon comps and at, at quiescent voltage, in other words, at idle with no voltage applied, they're probably going to test pretty close. But where you have to be worried about them is that they're 50 plus years old carbon comp resistors that have been hammered their entire lives and they, they're not reliable anymore they need to be pulled out of there you know good modern replacements which we're going to use uh, metal oxide ones they're cheap they're cheap what are you hanging on to those for they're not really affecting the sound of the amp in any meaningful way so just pull them out of there it's much safer you're going to be able to hammer on it with impunity and uh, there you go all right so that's really some of the most horrifying aspects of what's going on here. Let's have a look inside for a few more laughs, shall we? All right, now we're inside the inside here. And uh, the component side of the, of the eyelet board. And we're going to start over here. Fortunately, I was relieved to find uh, our lovely fr friends, the, uh, the Ajax Blue Molded Sausages in there. These are the heart of this amp. Good transformers. Blue sausages, that's where your tone lives in these guys. That's what you want. Now, as I said earlier, it looks like um, whoever did this either had a surplus of a certain value of cap or they had a sale or something. What they have here is a whole bunch of their 22 UF, which is these are bypass caps for um, the cathode resistor. Um, on the first preamp tube and uh, also the well basically the normal channel right there okay correct capacitance at 22 although the originals were 25 but they're 100 volt now in these preamp stages 100 volts is probably not going to ever properly form um, enough to do its job well reliably or quietly for that matter um, they put them here okay they also put them down here um, again uh, cathode bypass stuff uh, for preamp tubes then they used one down here uh, which is for uh, the vibrato uh, itself its cathode the, the vibrato tube um, or tremolo actually but yeah, they call it vibrato. This one's probably not quite such a tragedy. Um, I've taken to just using 50-volt caps across the board uh, in most cases. Sometimes I'll use 25s down here, depending on how much of what I've got in stock. But 50 is not you know, necessarily overkill. The originals were 25, and I've been replacing them with 25s forever, and 25s are plenty. But 100 is way too much. So as the comedy continues, we go down here to the bias supply where we're really going to get a hoot. They used one of those same caps for the bias supply cap. Didn't replace much else in there except a rectifier diode, a way too large rectifier diode as a matter of fact. And it's poorly installed in there. 
Uh, apparently one of these was blown. Friends, if you have one blown rectifier diode, just replace them all. They're 20 cents a piece, tops. Just replace them all. You can't possibly be in that big a hurry. Do it right. This cap, which is the same as the ones down in the low filter area, 22 UF, 100 volts. 100 volts, fine. That's what I'm going to put in there. 22 UF, not enough. Not enough. I'm going to use a 100 at 100. If we look at the schematic for the amp, we're going to see that the original cap there, let's see, the AB one, it's, it was 25 at 50. Um, <laughs> right there. Can you see that? Right there. You had a 10K uh, linear potentiometer, which is the trimmer for the bias supply, with a 27K resistor around it, and that's what's here. Then um, you had a, uh, a 25 UF at 50 volt with positive to ground because you're dealing with negative voltages here. And then the diode and a 470 ohm 1 watt resistor coming straight off the uh, power transformer, uh, straight off that tap. Okay, that's your bias supply right there. Okay, so it's 25 at 50 volts. So they went ahead and put 22 at 100 volts. I'm sure it probably works, but mother may I. I mean, just use something close to the correct value. It, they put it, it's lower capacitance and, and way higher voltage. If you're going to go way higher voltage, go up in capacitance too, particularly on these larger amps. You know, this is an 85 watt amp. Um, I'm going to put 100 at 100 in there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to rebuild this entire little board here, this entire board where this ridiculous replacement, they've just tack soldered this diode on there. That's, that's bad form. Um, these little bias supply components here, that diode and that resistor, those guys tend to, you know, they tend to go for a long time because it's a low voltage supply. I'm still going to replace those. They're old. And, you know, he wants this amp to be quiet and reliable, and so that's what we're going to do. Now, more comedy. If you look down in there, right there at this green wire right here, it's been, somebody's wrapped that wire around the lead that comes off this cap and runs to, to ground. You can see where it's been soldered to the chassis right there. Let's see if I can get this out of the way you can see it. See that right there? That right there that's loose. That, it, friends, that's the main ground connection in this amplifier. When they updated the power cord, they ran that wire, wrapped it around that, and soldered it. And that's your main ground connection. Are you kidding me? Are, are you seriously? Are you kidding me? That's your main ground? No, it's not. Not anymore. I'm going to fix that. We're going to put a proper terminal connection on that, and that's going to get connected right there to that screw where it deserves to be after I clean the chassis up and torque that thing down. And I'm going to solder the wire to its tab so it has a solid ground connection of its own right there. Oh, man. Crazy. And in light of all the work that was done, you would think that the screen grids and grid stopper resistors would have been replaced as well. Nope, they're original. These crusty little guys down in here, uh, your screen grids are these, these 470 ohm. Let's see if I can push the filament wires out of the way there. Those guys right there, 470 ohms, original grid stop, or screen grids. The grid stoppers are the 1.5Ks that are underneath uh, from, they're going in sort of a, this right there sort of a cross configuration that needs to be replaced those are old carbon comps even if this work was done 20 years ago those still should have been replaced because this is an area of the circuit that gets it takes punishment and they're mounted right to the power tubes these are the power tube sockets heat rises it comes to these resistors and it collects there and they get hotter and hotter and hotter and they can't displace all that heat 
so they get crunchier and crunchier and crunchier. I can't tell you how many times I've replaced screen grids that look exactly like this, and I'll desolder the tab that they're attached to, and they completely fall apart. So that has to be done. All of this needs to be done. We're going to clean this mess up for him. And, uh, yeah. Fortunately, the blue sausages are here. Many of the pots are, are original, um, if you look towards the front end of the amp. Um, and that's good, because uh, that helps you date an amplifier. I mean, if you've got to change a pot, you have to change a pot, because sometimes they go bad. They get little voids in them, and et, et cetera. You know, it happens. Uh, but you like to have them there, because that helps you put a, an exact date on an amplifier if something like the tube label is gone. In this case, it's here, so it's no big deal. Um, so I'm going to have to go through this thing. And while I'm in here, I'm going to take a very critical look at some of these other components. Uh, more often than not, the uh, bias splitter resistors up here, these 220Ks, more often than not, those go away. Oh, sorry, my hand was in the way when I was trying to point these right there. Let me zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Here we go. These guys right in there, there's two of them. Those are your bias splitter resistors. Those have a gold stripe. You can see it there. That means that they need to be a higher tolerance and closer to their value, which is 220K. So you need to be pickier about those, um, particularly under voltage. If you see something weird on a bias meter as you're trying to set up an amplifier, um, that can be a problem here. And then also your phase inverter plate resistors down here, this 100K and 82K. Those typically get replaced along with these caps. Usually I do a scorched earth down here because that's a stability section of the amplifier. The uh, blue sausages in these positions don't necessarily lend that much to the overall feel of an amp. So I don't feel bad about pulling those if I have to. Um, but the other stuff, I'm going to try and keep everything as, as stock as possible, you know. I've actually left, you know, these resistors in amplifiers drifted fairly far off their original value. Um, those are the uh, phase inverter grid resistors and the phase inverter cathode resistor, which is the one here in the center. Grids and cathode, all, of, all three of those, part of what's called the long-tailed pair uh, phase inverter. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times I'll leave those alone because um, they sound good doing that particular job. But anyway, we got some work to do here, and uh, that's the lay of the land. Um, I'm going to sign off for a few hours here whilst I dig in. Okay, uh, got, the, uh, got the choke off here. You can see how much... Uh, heat prostration there was uh, underneath and around that choke. Um, I think this thing had a flame out sometime in its life. It's just been real hot in that general area. A couple smacks with a with a screwdriver and a and a hammer. Uh, I didn't want to mess up any of my chisels, um, and that thing just popped right off. So I'm going to have to flatten that area out a little bit. I'll uh, probably have to remove the bias pot so I can get flat in there with a file and flatten that down. But uh, here is the old choke. And you can see where it was spot welded um, to the chassis. I guess that's one way to do it, huh? And then they spot welded the other tab on there on the other side. This poor thing has lived a hard life. Um, I just can't imagine that heating it up enough to be able to weld those ends like that was good for that choke. So we're going to um, we're gonna do something about that. We're going to put a new choke in. Um, I'll show you what I got here. Choke is pretty much a blunt instrument. So, you know, this is a fender part. It'll do just fine. It'll be reliable. It'll take the abuse. It'll let this thing soar again. So I'm going to do some cleanup here and uh, get this other choke mounted. And uh, then I'm going to go after these filter caps. Boy. All right. New choke installed. Ready to unleash its uh, 
goodness on the world. Um, so I was able to clear up the area of the chassis there where the spot welds were and make it flat so it would sit down there and got the area around it cleaned up um, so it's ready to go um, again what a head scratcher huh <clears throat> I'm I've seen thousands of amps over the years never seen anything like this never seen anybody spot weld a, a transformer to the chassis crazy 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 <laughs> humans are fun everyone should own one <laughs> oh man so crazy all right uh on to the filter caps take a long last look because they're going away all right here we are sometime later done some work had some lunch uh, got this all sorted out. Checked out the date caps on those sprigs, those big yellow orange sprigs that were in there, and they are from the. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we'll just go over this, shall we? Uh, well, they got several different dates here. I grabbed one that was seventy-nine. This one, seventy-nine, forty-third week. This one is 78, 21st week. So, very old spread caps that were incorrect anyway. Um, now, as you can see, we're all freshened up, freshened up, <laughs> I should say, and ready to rock here. Got the F and T's, my uh, standard here in the shop. Kind of just settled into a rhythm with those. I've used a lot of brands over the years, including Sprague, <clears throat> and I just find that the F&Ts um, do the best for me. Now you can see tucked in there one of the bridging, or I keep saying bridging, <laughs> yes, uh, that is a bridging resistor here, 220K right there. We looked at those on the schematic, remember? <laughs> Sorry. Uh... And then uh, this is the main total pole, the first node in the power supply. Uh, two 100Fs, UFs rather, uh, wired as a totem pole. That gives you 50 at 700 volts. So there you go. And then we have the, the uh, preamp filtering here as well as those bridging resistors right there. Got the 1K. And the 4.7, where they belong. Everything's cleaned up. Um, not only were... <laughs> you heard what I said earlier about the sprigs that were in there. They were tack soldered onto these eyelets. So they weren't even... <clears throat> they didn't even bother to take the time, which you, sh you have to do. If you're going to do this professionally, you have to do it right, okay? And to do these right... You have to remove the solder. I used to espouse the virtues of clipping off the old leads and making little eyelets. No, I don't do that anymore. I've seen where they can fail personally. Um, they're more convenient when it's time to, to change caps again, but it's just better. It doesn't take that much longer. It's not that much effort, and it's just better. But the previous caps had just been tack soldered onto these eyelets. And in most cases, the they had just clipped off the old caps and left those leads down in there. So it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was less than desirable. Kind of had me worked up, honestly. But that's your filter supply. And along with the new choke down there, we've got a completely rebuilt filter supply on this amp, which is cool. It's going to help it run better and cooler and fatter and bigger. And that's what you want out of this amp. Yeah. So, that's all for this side of the chassis. I'm going to go after the internals now. All right. Rectifier and bias supply board. I've got it pulled up and out of the chassis so we can see what we're doing here. I've already removed the capacitor. And uh, here are the other two components in that bias supply. The diode and the 470 ohm resistor that we looked at earlier. 
Those will be going away along with all six of these rectifier diodes. You can see that someone has replaced one of them. This is kind of like... It, it's kind of like driving down the road with four bald tires and one of them blows and you put a brand new one in there and you keep driving. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand that. Diodes are cheap. Uh, all it really costs you is some time and effort. And it's done right, you know. Here's my advice to technicians and aspiring technicians out there. Don't assume that no one's ever going to see your work. Because whoever did this, you know, clearly they did it back in the late 70s, early 80s maybe. I don't know. Judging by the dates on those caps and a few of the other things I've seen change in here, that's probably when it was done or around that time. Don't assume that no one's going to see your work, that it's your dirty little secret, and as long as the amp functions, no one's going to care. Um, don't assume that, because someday, someone may open up an amp, look at your work, and splash it all over the internet. And so, <laughs> you know, there, there, there's only one way to do things, as far as I'm concerned, and that's the right way. And the right way is the way I try to do things. It's a little more labor intensive, but it's worth it because it'll last. Um, in my business, I can't afford to have people coming back with um, amplifiers that they've taken out of here uh, with the assumption that whatever's wrong with them is repaired and they don't have to worry about it. And, you know, a few gigs or a few weeks or even a few months later, it fails on them. I can't have that. All I've got is my reputation, and my reputation here, I try to build it on quality work. And this here that we're looking at in this amp, this is not quality work. This was a duct tape fix. Now, there are certain... It's a, there's a possibility this was being used by a touring musician, and he pulled into you know some town somewhere in the middle of America with one guy fixing amps out of a music store or something, and he was in a hurry. He, had, he, you know, he was only in town for a few hours, and it was his primary amp or even a backup or whatever, and he needed it fixed in a hurry. So we're going to let that slide for the most part. But it really doesn't take that much longer to do it right. It really doesn't. Someone would have to be in an extreme hurry for me to slop through something like this has been slopped through. So anyway, that's the... Uh, Buy a supply on the bottom and the rectifier diodes, and we're going to redo this thing. Okay, we're progressing right along here. Um, rectifier diodes are all brand new. Uh, the rectifier diodes I use, let me look at them here so I can tell you for sure. They are a, I bought a ton of them years ago, 97. 36 RP. Essentially, <clears throat> that is a one and a half amp, 1,000 volt rectifier diode. It, it's got headroom to spare. They'll probably la outlast the amplifier, honestly. And uh, yeah, the 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 one that got replaced in here, this one, was was the one that was the odd man out. That is a 1N5408, which is a 3-amp 1,000-volt diode. That's hideously large, folks. The problem you run into when you get that big, um, th th that can actually run into damage issues. I mean, the fuse is going to blow first, obviously, but if what if it doesn't? You know, what if there's a problem with one of the other rectifier diodes and that one just makes up for it? You know, I mean, diodes tend to work until they short. So maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just looking at smoke signals here. But anyways, um, been redone, as we can see, bias supply, all done. 470 ohm resistor. Uh, that is a metal oxide, one watt. Um, I just use the same... Uh, diode that I use in the bias supply uh, doesn't really matter any you know good diode usually you know you usually see one in four thousand sevens in amplifiers which are fine I like to beef them up a little bit but 
you know i've got so many of them that's what i use and then uh f and t 100 microfarad 100 volt capacitor for the bias supply so yeah there we go that little guy is all ready to get back into the amp and we're going to move on up the board here all right we're up onto the main board now and i've done everything i'm going to do with this first wave here um, if we look closely in here you can see i've gotten rid of those enormo caps that were right here and put in the appropriate 25 at 25 caps i also replaced uh, this resistor was fine. This one was not. It had drifted almost 100% of its value away. So I replaced those with some carbon films. Let's see if I can get in here a little tighter. Um, this bypass here, uh, cap and resistor, is for the normal channel first preamp cathode and resistor bypass arrangement. And the one, or this one right here, and the one on the left of this pair is the vibrato channel first preamp cathode resistor and capacitor okay so those got changed out we come down here and these are the normal and vibrato channels second preamp cathode resistor and capacitor so this is for this the second preamp in other words gain makeup basically um, these resistors this 820 and uh this 2.7K here, these were good. They're original, and I left them in place, and we just changed out the caps. And then we come down here, uh, this 25 here. I like to use a 50 volt there. Um, originals usually have a 50, but not always. Sometimes they have a 25. That is actually a vibra vibrato cathode and resistor bypass. Uh, it's for the vibrato. And it sees a fair amount of voltage swing back and forth. Uh, the resistor was good, so I left it, this 100K. And I've replaced this cap here with a 25 at 50 volt. This is a new, new one I'm trying. This is actually a mod cap. Uh, I get those from CE Electronics. I haven't tried any yet. I like the fact that they're silver, which um, a lot of mid-period fenders... Uh, from the 70s forward had those, those old Mallory's that were in there were, were silver a lot of times in the later ones. So it's a nice look. We'll see how their performance is. That's all I've done to the board. Um, I'm kind of hopeful that the rest of it's going to swing my way uh, when I apply power to this bad boy. So that's all for the board. Now we're going to swing this thing around and I'm going to replace the uh, screen grid resistors and the grid stoppers and then all that will be left is to rewire the power cord give it a proper ground I'm going to bypass the courtesy outlet and the ground switch those are not necessary and I like to wire around them and uh, yeah then after that we're gonna be home free hopefully all right we're coming to the end of this you can see where I've removed the power cord completely. So I'm going to redo that thing. I'm going to use the power cord that's in there um, to make it a little bit shorter, but it's going to be fine. Uh, what we're looking at here are my screen grids and grid stopping resistors. Ah. Screen grids are here and here between pins four and six of the power tubes there and there and the grid stoppers are down here in between pin five and pin one <laughs> ouch oh had to scratch my back <laughs> I was distracted momentarily uh, sorry about that <laughs> so pin pin five and pin one So you can you can see the work that was done there. Got rid of the old crusty ones. These are five the screen grids that are in there are five waters. Those will handle punishment. Um, and particularly since heat rises out of that socket and up into there, 
Um, yeah, it just it just works better. I did not have to put the filament wires. These guys right here. Look at these. Look at these guys. Look at nice tight uh, coil there. Very nicely done. Nice lead dress here in this amp overall. Uh, 65. They were still even though this is a CBS era, March of 65. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, this is Fender Electric Instrument. This, I think this is pre CBS. Yeah, yeah, March of 65 would still be. Gosh, I don't. It seems like it was October 64 when he, he sold. <laughs> I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. Somebody can dive in and correct me here. But anyway, um, you know, look at that nice filament dress there. Very nice. Very, very nicely done. Um, and I did not have to correct the phase on the power tube sometimes uh, because uh, octal power tubes are not naturally hum canceling. Sometimes you want uh, the, the, uh, the filament pins on these are pin 7 and pin 2. And they're joined together and then twisted and gone to the next tube and the next tube, etc. You want pin 7 to go to pin 7 and so forth. You don't want them crossing over because that can introduce hum. Not so much a problem with 12AX7s because they are naturally humbucking. Um, but with the power tubes, you want those to be in phase. And from the factory, marvel of marvels... Um, they are in phase, which is a happy thing. So, anyway, screen grids are done. Going to do the power cable and uh, charge the caps. And we'll be starting to come down to the end of this bad boy here. All right. Everything is finished. Um, I've reinstalled the power cord and done it properly. Let's see if I can get over the top here so you can see this a little better filaments out of the way there we go all right there it is that is the properly installed ground wire I've cleaned the chassis right there where it connects and torqued that thing down and soldered the wire to that connector so we've got a nice tight ground connection now also I did the power the way I prefer to do the power, which puts the fuse behind everything. It's real simple, kids. Black wire, the death wire, goes straight to bypassing that switch, bypassing the courtesy outlet. We send that thing straight to the end of the fuse holder, period. Black wire, fuse holder. The uh, other side of the fuse holder has a wire that goes over to that right terminal of the uh, power switch. Other side of the power switch goes to uh, the power transformer. And the other power transformer wire is joined directly to the white wire. I usually like to put a terminal in here somewhere to hold those wires together but I've twisted them together and shrunk tubed them and stuck them back in there and that seems to work pretty well as well um, generally I like to get a little tag strip and do it properly but there's nowhere to put one here close by here's the uh, opposite view of the the screen grids and the grid stoppers on the power tube sockets but I like to remove the courtesy outlet and the death cap and polarity switch from the circuit. They're not necessary. It's a relic of an earlier time. Once you have a three ground, three prong cord or three wired AC cable or other, uh, it's not necessary. You don't need it. So that is the end of uh, this first wave of repairs on this. Hopefully that's going to be everything and nothing else rears its ugly head. Um, and we'll have it fine tuned and ready to go. He's got new power tubes for it, some nice TAD uh, 6L6 STRs, black plates. So uh, those are going in this bad boy. And uh, I'm running out of time for today uh, to do a play demo. But uh, if I have time to do it tomorrow, 
I will slap a microphone on this thing and let you hear what it sounds like. I still have to charge up the filter caps and, uh, you know, set the idle, set the idle current right there with the bias adjustment pot. And uh, that's kind of it, really. Um, taking care of everything inside here. The inside of this amp is not Marx Brothers anymore. It's not funny anymore. It's deadly serious. So anyway, <laughs> um, eh, that's all I got time for today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this little video, this little tour of horrors inside this this poor amplifier. Look for the part two of this video, which will be the play demo. And I'll we'll let you hear what it sounds like. Uh, if you have any questions about anything we do here at Granville Guitars, seek us out on the web at www.granvilleguitars.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, and the blog is over at WordPress, a view from the Granville bench. That's all I know for today. Be good to one another.